This episode's part of a special feature series on New York City and is a co-presentation with the Museum of the City of New York with generous support from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Find us at yourhometown.org or on your favorite podcast app. When that song came out, Suzanne, what did your siblings or your mom think about the song? You know, I don't really know. <laughs> I never, I, I didn't, I never asked them and they never told me. I, the one I really cared about was Ed. You know, that was the one I was really frightened of. Uh, to this day, I don't, I, I have no idea. <laughs> I, don't have, I have no idea. I'll have to ask my mother. I'll have to be like, hey, Ma, what did you think? Where did you grow up is a question we're all asked a lot. But the answer is never as simple as a place on a map, is it? It's about the kid inside of us and what happened to them there, before we met the world and the world met us. I'm Kevin Burke, and this is Your Hometown. My name is Luca. I live on the second floor. I live upstairs from you. Yes, I think you've seen me before. That's Luca by my guest Suzanne Vega. It came out in 1987, and it touched a nerve for a lot of people telling this painful story from a child's point of view, something that really hadn't been done very much in pop music before. At the time, Suzanne didn't want interviewers to ask her where she was in the boy's story. It wasn't the artist's job. Luca was the name of a kid in a building where she lived, she said, and the plight of children was something she cared deeply about. But that's where she chose to leave it. Before the pandemic, Suzanne went back to Luca during her residency at New York City's famous Cafe Carlisle, which isn't too far south of East Harlem in Manhattan, where she spent her early years before her family moved across town. Out of those performances came an album called An Evening of New York Songs and Stories, in which Suzanne weaves together her prolific career as one of the most respected singer-songwriters of our time with her lifelong relationship to the city where she grew up and where she still lives. The first time I ever heard Luca, I was an 11-year-old child. And when I went back to it with Suzanne, I was a father, and I heard it differently. And I wondered what, if anything, had changed for her. As we move through life, we're always furthest in time from our childhoods. But that doesn't mean they're the furthest from our sense of ourselves or our souls. When we met, it was by way of a remote connection. Suzanne in her New York City apartment, me and mine. You moved to New York from California at, when you were two and a half years old. And you spent you know, the first five years of your life living on one side of Manhattan, in East Harlem, and then 10 years living on the other side of Manhattan, on the Upper West Side. How, how do you differentiate the two places in your own mind when you think about them? My East Harlem world was pretty small. Um, we had a front yard, which was different than the other houses in the neighborhood, which were more like tenement houses. Uh, and we had a backyard, but it was uh, used f like a lot of people threw their garbage out the window. So we, we, it, <laughs> there was all kinds of stuff back there. Um, <laughs> and you never knew if you were gonna get hit with a flying bottle. So you would not, like we didn't go out there and play. Just like me. So the apartment that we moved to on the Upper West Side was was big um, on 102nd Street. It uh, had two long hallways and uh, it seemed like a palace to me. And of course, as I grew up, my uh, way of traveling into the world sort of grew. My father mm -hmm. would send me to the candy store which was right around the corner. So I didn't have to cross the street. I could just go to the corner, turn right, go to the candy store, get the newspaper, his cigarettes, whatever, you know, I was six years old and they would give me the cigarettes. <laughs> um, and I could then come back home 
so learning how to cross that huge, learning how to cross Broadway was like crossing the ocean for the first time. I mean, it was yeah, four lanes, the big it's median. Gigantic. I mean, you could get killed, it, it, especially as a young, yeah. small child. It was a little tougher, actually, on a on a, living in 102nd Street in the 70s. You were questioned more often. You know, are you really Puerto Rican? Uh, is your father black? You know, when you're four and five and six, it you know you, it's a sweet age, and you're there with your community. You, you're there with other kids, and it's just more sweet and friendly. By the time you're you know, 11, 12, 13, you have to prove yourself. People are always, like, in your face. And you've spoken about in, in, in your book uh, that you have to actually sometimes defend yourself physically. Yes, from time to time, which, uh, you know, I, it wasn't something that I liked. Um, it's not, it wasn't something mm-hmm. that came naturally to me, but it was something that I felt I had to do. And, and if you don't fight back in some way, um, then it just keeps going on. And then you have no self-respect. So I learned pretty early on to stand up for myself, to fight back, to, to say something which was very difficult for me. Um, and if I couldn't say something, I mean, there were times where, yeah, I would lash out at someone and, and hit them. Some of these scenes happened at a place called CCWS, Children's Community Workshop School, which was what we call progressive school. Um, uh, <laughs> meaning there was very little, to my way of thinking, there was very little structure. You know, the teachers didn't always have control of the kids. You would always get tested and teased and provoked, uh, and then you'd have to come back, and then uh, a lot of times it would all settle down, you know, depending on who it was. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the people, I think, just wanted to get to know you. So it was a way of, like, getting to know you. What are your limits? Um, what what will yeah. you put up with? I know that the Southern writer Carson McCullers is a touchstone yeah. for you and has been for a long time since you were a teenager. And of course, you did uh, an album on her and a, and a, sh- a, broad, a musical yep. on her uh, and her life and actually played her. So she's really a kind of an important figure. And I was reading the other night uh, her stories, kind of preparing for this interview, and I was struck by in how one of her stories, The Orphanage, she has this line about childhood that just it stuck out to me. And I wrote it down and I thought, I want to ask Suzanne about this. She says, The memories of childhood are like clear candles in an acre of night, illuminating fixed scenes from the surrounding darkness. And I took that to mean that there, you know, when we think back at, at that point in our life, it's not that we have always a clear narrative running through everything. They're more like these, these candles that shoot up and they light up a certain moment or a certain scene. And even if all that's around it is sort of obscured, that's very visceral, and very strong in our minds. What, what is one of those candles for you? Well, I, I have kind of a freakish memory. I can almost put myself in the room where something happened and, and pick out uh, uh, the details. Um, I suppose there's one that, uh, there's one little scene that I remember which my stepfather had written me a story. Um, I read a lot as a kid. I learned how to read when I was three and uh, and Ed was a writer, so this was kind of nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, he was so he told me he'd written a story for me uh, about one of my toys called Nosy, and um, apparently Nosy there was that there was this hole in the wall in the wall, and you could go through it, and, and you know he walked and he talked, and he uh, he you know he was alive, and so I sort of went down this rabbit hole with him. It, it, in the end, it turned out to be a bit like Alice in Wonderland. Um, so he had, uh, but the thing is, when he gave me this story, he had this long, narrow piece of paper, and they were taped together. He wrote the whole thing typewritten, and it was this sort of scroll that he had given me. Huh. And he said to me, I was so excited when I wrote this story that I had wrote it all out in one piece of paper, and I wanted to give it to you. 
uh, and I and he gave this to me with a kind of important air. And I realized it took me years, I think, to realize that this was a reference to Jack Kerouac. When, and I was thinking and on the road as you were talking. I didn't want to say right, thought, exactly. Yeah, so, but on the road. I mean, I, I was six yeah. years old, you know, five. Um, I read things, but I certainly didn't read On the Road by Jack Kerouac at the age of five. So mm -hmm. I kind of mm -hmm. missed the joke of it. And I remember the visceral feeling of disappointment that somehow I disappointed him by not really responding in the way that he would have expected me to or he wanted me to. Uh, and then years later, I realized that it was this joke. Um, and he kind of did that often. Of course, there are, par there are parts of us that want our kids to grow up faster because you want to connect yeah. with them. Right? You want to share things with them. But at the same time, you have to take them <laughs> for the age yeah. they're at. And so what, what strikes me in the story you told about on the road in Kerouac, you know, he wanted to connect in a certain way and it required an understanding in your brain to do that that wasn't really possible. Right. You know, if we wanted to talk about ideas or any uh, kind of schooling, any kind of education, uh, if we wanted to talk about politics or if you wanted to talk about uh, philosophy or, you know, those things were welcome. Um, but there was an emotional sort of undercurrent that was really difficult to navigate because he would ha he had a hot temper and he would very often be angry. Mm -hmm. So you would try and figure out, you know, how not to have him get angry at you. In 1949, we came to, to the South Bronx, which was then an Irish neighborhood mostly, and I was kind of a spaced out kid, destined obviously to become a poet, uh, which is just a thankless profession. So I became a novelist, almost as thankless. But um, I was this big already at 13 when I arrived. And I went out in the street. I was a pretty good uh, roller skater. And the kids were amazed that this kid could roller skate so much. And they, they befriended me, you know. And, um, after a while, they recognized that I had some sort of athletic ability, and because I was so spaced out, they mistook it for like great courage. And you know, if they pushed me, I pushed them back, you know, and it was just like a game. So they took to me and asked me to join the Shamrocks. I even changed my name from Ed Vega, you know, to Eddie McVeigh. Just for those who are going to listen, uh, this is Ed Vega, is his name, or, and, or also known as Edgardo Vega Yunque. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he is uh, someone posthumously now who people read his work and, uh, you know, toward the end of his life had some success with yeah. his writing, but certainly at the sense that he was toiling at it and working at it for many, many mm -hmm. years. And I was struck, uh, I saw a panel discussion at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies mm -hmm. in New York, and it was a posthumous panel, and they had distinguished professors from Columbia and other schools in New York talking about his work, his writing, yeah. his fiction. Yeah. And the last person to speak was your sister, Allison. Oh, yes. People were talking about him as sort of cantankerous. You know, he, he could be difficult, but what a mind and what an interesting guy. And then she gave this really interesting take. He was not cantankerous. He was not cranky. He was a very, very angry man. <laughs> he was furious at the world, and he did not want to pick up the sword. He chose instead to pick up the pen. But, you know, there were times when he could not resist, and the words failed him. And he chose violence. Words were very, very important growing up Vega. Careful selection around the dinner table. The right choice and admiration ensued. The wrong and a full-fledged assault began. And I thought, wow, you know, what must have been like for you to grow up around that dynamic? Someone who's such a force, such a powerful force. Um, as a child in that space? Well, I mean, Ed Vega was kind of like the weather. You know, if he was happy, then the sun was out. And if he was unhappy, then it was like dark, stormy clouds and, and you know, s tornadoes and cyclones. I mean, uh, he influenced every aspect of our lives. And were there times, Suzanne, as a kid, especially the oldest of four siblings, where you were, that you can think of as a story or a moment where you were particularly scared for them, or scared for yourself, or scared for your for your mom, Pat. All the time, um, all the time. It was a rare day when you didn't feel that kind of waking up and seeing what's going on. I mean, there it sort of went in cycles. Uh, there were times where he could be calm, he could be funny, he could be he would teach us about things. 
um, if I was sick or something, he would he would come and talk to me by the side of the bed. I remember he taught me how to whistle once when I was sick in bed with something. <laughs> um, so he could be very kind, and, and but then on the other hand, he could switch, uh, and sometimes you wouldn't know what it what what it was. So sometimes I think it must have been connected to whatever was happening in the news cycles. I mean, when he went away and marched with uh, Martin Luther King, March, March on Washington, March on Washington, yeah. Yeah, August of 63. 63. So um, I remember feeling worried for him because he was black, and I knew that this could be dangerous for him. We had all these social studies books from, like, the 40s lying around the house, and some of them had very graphic pictures of of hangings, lynchings. Um, so I, I, lynchings, so I knew wow. that that these things happened, and so I remember feeling anxious for him. So I, I think Ed must have felt himself under siege, you know, and he had this woman who was uh, white from the Midwest. She was practically a Midwestern farm girl in some ways uh, who had... Your mom, Pat, yeah, from yeah she was from Minnesota, but she'd grown up. She had gone to high school in um, California. So... Okay. So there he is with this white wife, and uh, these were very difficult times for a, a biracial couple. It, it, you know, he explained to us that in some um, states that this was illegal. So we felt afraid for him. But a lot of times we felt afraid of him because he was violent and he was... Um, he wasn't just cantankerous. He was violent. And so... You know, we we never knew what the hell was going to happen or what would set it off. And physically, physically, physically violent. violent. Yeah. It was his hands, um, which were mm. you know lethal enough. Um, and he would, but he could sometimes hit the wall or he would throw something against the wall. He'd throw food against the wall. Um, wow! But uh, he would he would hit you. He would hit us. Hit us. Um, in various ways, which I, you know, I'd rather not enumerate what kinds of ways, but um, that's that's what he did. Uh, so, yeah. you know. And as the oldest of of the of the siblings, what was your role in these situations? There was no way I was going to get in between Ed and my mother, or Ed and any of the the kids. I would find myself cleaning something. <laughs> You know, like, oh, uh, this is a good time to clean the stove, um, you know, especially if I had to stay yeah. in the room because there were times where he'd be talking to my mother. And if I tried to creep out, he'd say, this concerns you too. get back in here. So if he was arguing with my mother, my role was usually to take the kids and do something with them. Uh, sometimes I sang to them. Sometimes I would tell them a story. Sometimes we'd go watch TV once we had a TV set in the house because we didn't get one of those until later on. Um, so usually I tried to take their minds off of it. Sometimes I would listen to what was going on to see if there was something I should be learning, something I should know, something I... Uh, if, if someone else was getting yelled at for something they did wrong, I would usually be listening to try and figure out, like, is this something I should know for myself so I can stay out of trouble? Next time, from time to time, I would write down whatever he was saying, whatever was going on. Uh, at t most of the time, there was some kind of impulse of trying to teach somebody something. But his ways and his methods of teaching were sometimes very violent. You know, I'll give you an example. He would say, uh, if you're going to stand on a chair, you know, make sure that the back of the chair is against the wall because otherwise you could really hurt yourself if you fall off the chair and your foot gets caught in the back of the chair and you fell over like that. So, okay, you know, but then if you forgot that and you brought the chair over and you stood on it and you had the back the wrong way, he could get violent about that. You're doing it the wrong way and he'd, like, smack you. Um, you know, and it, it was always, it, it very often seemed not quite proportional to what it was that you were doing. Just another guy
think your sister described it as just having a rage. There was a rage yeah. about him, and it seemed like she was linking it to his frustrations over his his life, his, his situation. But he was an inspiring writer, as you say. And he would often say, like, you know, this novel's going to be the great one. You know, and it, but it wouldn't always, it wouldn't play out. You know, this, this bigger than, larger than life force. But in a place like New York, so I'm thinking about your song, New York as a Woman, New York can be indifferent to you. Yeah, yeah. Right? You're just another guy. Yeah. There were a lot of things. Uh, that's part of it. But it, it's, it's also more than that. I think that he himself was an abused child. Um, that he had been mm-hmm. abused um, as a child. I, I learned l- later in life that this had happened. So I, I think there were a lot of things at play. There was his own natural temperament. There was his uh, sense of frustration. Um, and then there was um, the, the roots of the thing, which I think maybe if these things had not happened when he was a child, m- maybe he could have channeled it differently. Uh, but I think there were certain events that happened that, that, um, that were very hard for him to contain. I think it's cause I'm clumsy. I try not to talk too loud. Maybe it's because I'm crazy. I try not to act too proud. You know, everyone who's listening, and including me, will, will have heard your song, Luca. And you've talked about your commitment to the cause of, of, of shining a light on child abuse. And I remember when the song came out, a lot of people wondered about it, kind of what was the story. And people would ask you who Luca was. And as an artist, I think rightfully, you've just put a pushback and said, I'm not going to go there. I, I don't really want to talk about it from that point yeah, of view. I avoided it, yeah. Um, uh, you probably yeah. remember that. But I was going to ask you a different question, which is, when that song came out, Suzanne, what did your siblings or your mom think about the song? You know, I don't really know. <laughs> I never, I, I didn't, I never asked them and they never told me. I, the one I really cared about was Ed. You know, that was the one I was really frightened of. Uh, to this day, I don't, I, I have no idea. <laughs> I, don't have, I have no idea. I'll have to ask my mother. I'll have to be like, hey, Ma, what did you think? I, I, I don't know, it never occurred to me to find out. Um, it was Ed that I was afraid of, uh, and that he would, that he might think it was about him, that he would know that it was about him, um, and yeah. uh, so I played him the album, and he figured out that it was about child abuse, and he said, "I want to talk to you about that song." And I remember my stomach flipped over, and I said, uh, "Okay." And he said, is that about child abuse? And I said, yeah. And he says, I think you're glamorizing a very ugly subject. And I was like, I don't think so. I don't think so. And he said, where did you get the idea for that song? And I stared at him like, are you kidding me? So I said what I say to everybody. There's this boy named Luca, and he lived in my building, and he lived upstairs, and I... You know, I said that. So he said, oh, okay. So he said, you wrote it out of concern for the child. And I said, well, no, I mean, I knew that the child wasn't abused, but it was, I was sort of imagining what if he had been. Um, and I said, I don't think I'm glamorizing anything. I think I'm saying what the child would say. And to my surprise, he accepted it. And he said, okay, well, I think you may be glamorizing it. I said, you might be responding to the production because the production makes it sound really triumphant but that's we just made it sound like that so it would get played on the radio so he accepted it and he uh, went on to and then he went on to do, then we talked about Casper Hauser where it said uh, I want to be a writer like my father which of course Ed is a writer and I remember he he blushed slightly at that so we moved off that topic um, and then it wasn't until like the end of the year uh, where I was in a hotel somewhere, and he said, you know, that song could almost be about you, he said, finally, after like a year of it being on the radio and being successful and all that stuff. And I, I said, yes, that's right. And that was as far as we took it. We never discussed it beyond that.
at age eight, you ran away, um, and you ended up in the park, which I'm assuming was Riverside Park. It's I don't Riverside, know, yeah. but I was going to ask you what you were running from, and what you were running to when you you decided to to try the road. <laughs> to hit the road, that's right. I was going to hit the road. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things Ed used to have us do was, uh, if he didn't like something we had done, he would have us to s- sit on a chair and face the wall. You know, if you're eight years old, you mm-hmm. normally you would face the wall for like eight minutes. But I-, I think Ed would forget that we were there. So it would be an hour or longer, depending on whether or not he remembered that you were sitting there. So there was one day when, I, I can't remember what I had done, but I was facing the wall and I had friends over and so my friends were trying to sort of whisper to me and wanted me to come and play with them, and I couldn't. And so I just suddenly decided I don't want to be here anymore. I just don't want to be here. I've really had it. And I picked myself up and announced that I was running away and waved goodbye. And I don't even know what I took with me. I don't remember taking anything in particular. And I think everyone thought it was very funny. Um, they they laughed and they stood at the door and waved goodbye to me as I pressed the elevator button and went downstairs. So I remember being very confident that I would um, go to the park and would live on the stuff they had there growing. It looked like food to me. Uh, you know, it looked like <laughs> spinach or it looked like salad at least, (laughs) berries, you know, there were things you could eat. So I felt, I just felt this confidence that nature would look after me. And I went to Riverside Park. Um, I walked uptown. So somehow I ended up, there was this older boy at the time who uh, was probably, I think he told me he was 12. He was out roaming around. Um, He told me he was looking for a girlfriend. And, and and I this didn't really register with me. I said I didn't know anybody. Um and he told me to come to this wall and suddenly he kissed me on the mouth and this was very frightening to me and I started to cry. Um and I suddenly thought I I I don't want to run away anymore. This is way more than I bargained for. And he told me not to cry. He said his, his his grandmother had raised him to be a good boy. And so, but then he started walking really fast and he told me to follow him. And I took some tentative steps oh towards my. him. And then I thought, I, I don't have to listen to him. And I turned around and I left. I, I went out of the park as fast as I could, went back to 102nd Street. And I still didn't really want to go home, but um, then I saw my mother coming up the street. I think a few hours had passed. So she um, took me and brought me back home, um, and we had a chat, and then uh, I went to bed. But this, uh, I was very aware that I had failed in this running away business. Um, This was not Huck Finn. This was not Huck Finn. I I had read Huck Finn. I loved Huck Finn. I I thought it was one of the few truthful books that actually existed, where they actually had Mm -hmm. black people in them. And and where adults did weird bad bad and things. And an abusive father. Yes, exactly. That's what right? I'm saying. Pappy is the abusive father. He runs right. away. Right. So I yep. thought this is. But you were on a on a life raft in the Mississippi. There was a Hudson River, <laughs> right. Right? Was Riverside Plus Park. A girl, which makes you know, <laughs> if I'd have been a boy, maybe it would have been different. Yes. I don't know. But yes. um, but there I'm this girl wandering around. So, but in my mind, in my mind, I was like Huck Finn. <laughs> after you ran away, tried to run away at eight, and you find out that you are not Ed's daughter, right? Up until that point, you thought that you were one of four children. These are your parents, Ed and Pat. You're Suzanne Vega. What were the circumstances? Like, why, how and why did he tell you that then? Um, Ed had this idea that I, I had trouble expressing myself emotionally because I, um didn't really express myself the way Allison did or even Matthew or Timothy. Um, I, I was very detached. 
Um, so Ed would sort of put it, take it upon himself to sit me down in front of him and sort of play therapist. It was a sort of confrontation. You know, and he would ask me, how do you feel about X, Y, or Z? And I, you know, um, I mean, sometimes I didn't feel anything, or sometimes I didn't feel anything until much later. Uh, and a lot of times my true feelings came in the form of an image or w what we would call a metaphor. One, one little breakthrough we made was yeah. uh, I said, uh, my stomach, it feels like a rumpled blanket. And this seemed like a great, he was like, oh, a, rum a rumpled blanket. So that was something he understood. But even so, he wanted the emotion connected with it. So unless I displayed the emotion in, an, in, an, in a sort of way that you would as a, like an actor, it wasn't satisfying to him. So we would have these long discussions that would go on. So it was one of those nights, and I honestly, I don't remember what, what we were doing before he said this, because obviously when he said this, it knocked everything else out of, out of the way. The minute he said, I feel you should know that I'm not really your father. I mean, I can't, I, I was like, I thought it was a joke. I thought this was one of his weird jokes. I thought, oh, he's gonna see, he's gonna see if I believe him. And I, and I don't, <laughs> I don't believe him. Um, and he said, uh, I, have you ever wondered why you don't look like me? And I wasn't sure what the right answer was. And I thought maybe I was being tested. So I said, well, I said, I, the right answer seemed to be yes. So I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'm not really your father. And this, you know, I, my, my mind just kind of hit like a blank, smooth, it was like an ice skating rink. I mean, suddenly there's like nothing to hold on to and there's no, no detail, there's nothing there. Yeah. So I'm trying yeah. to think who could possibly be my father, you know, and the Marvin from next door suddenly popped into his Marvin from next door. Is he my father? You know, <laughs> who is my father? So uh, he's mentioned some guy in California that I never heard of and didn't know. Um, and then my mother walked in the room and he said, I'm telling her about, about Richard. Although he didn't say Richard, he said, I'm telling her about Dick. And I was, and she, to my surprise, seemed to know all about this. And she said, oh, and she frowned. And, uh, so I thought, oh, she knows about this. So either she's in on the joke or this must be true. And it took ages for me to get it all straight in my mind. And, I, and thinking about the power that he wielded at that moment to, to share this with you at, at, when you were nine, your mom walking in the room, one might think that was her, that was her story to tell you. So he, he took that power from her. Well, he certainly did. Uh, I never had the idea that this was something she ever wanted to, to talk about, really, or to tell me about. Um, but in a lot of ways, she was watching Ed as carefully as we were as the children. He had decided the time had come to tell the truth. I think the deception was uncomfortable for him. Um, it was different mm -hmm. when I was little. It was sort of a cute story to tell me when I was little, but now things were were uh, changing. I seem to remember I ran away at eight and he probably told me when I was nine. So there had already been an issue between us. Um, that's why I left. So I think he therefore felt it was time for me to right. know the truth. So I imagine the, the ripple effect of all this um, must have been massive. It was. Oh, my God. It was huge. Um, it, 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 it took me a few days to realize I had a different name completely than the one I had grown up with. Um, I wasn't Susie Vega at all. <laughs> I had a completely different name, which I don't feel I need to share with you guys, but, um, you know, it was a different name on my birth certificate, a completely different one. So that was shocking to realize that. Um, so then I had to pretend that I was still half Puerto Rican in school because to be half Puerto Rican was sort of a badge of honor, whereas to be white was not considered you know, it, it, it was a bad era to be white in. You know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. we were all learning about all the bad things that white people had done um, over time. You know, it was very confusing, but it, on a, in a way I thought, okay, 
it does kind of make sense because I, I always felt myself a little different um, from everybody, even from my mother, because everyone always said, if, if anybody said to Ed, where did she come from? Um, she looks like her mother is basically what he would say. And in some ways I do, but in other ways I really don't. So it, it sort of clicked in my mind and I knew that it was true. Um, and the other thing is that over time I realized that I think they had not told me out of love and compassion, especially Ed's family, because they were very accepting of me. They really loved me. They they taught me Spanish. They taught me songs in Spanish and played games with me. And so I always felt very loved by Ed's family. Um, so I think that yeah. back in the day it was just considered that what you did. You don't you didn't need to make a big deal out of it. You didn't have to, you know, tell tell everybody. One of the things that struck me lis listening to you talk about your childhood and you've written this, is that you were a girl growing up in a hard urban environment. Yeah. Where did you find beauty? Where did you find peace, you know, that you, as a child that you felt like? Um, I think it was the world of art. You know. uh, it was in music, which was everywhere. Uh, music was mm -hmm. on the radio. Um, mm -hmm. Music was played by the babysitters when they came over. Um, Ed was a huge jazz enthusiast and played jazz yeah. constantly, which I loved. Uh, my actual birth father who also loved jazz. Uh, actually, it's the, the one thing the two f fathers have in common is their love of jazz. Uh, I studied ballet from the time I was nine years old onward. Right. And uh, the museums I loved, uh, especially the metro... Sorry, it's my my husband's coughing in the other room. Did you hear that? Okay. All right, okay. All right, just let me know if we have to stop. <laughs> um so I loved the museums. I loved um, especially the Metropolitan Museum, which I loved it more than the modern because my parents were always dragging us to the modern, but I had kind of felt like the Met sort of belonged to me personally. Um, yeah. So, uh, and books. I could find myself in so many books. Um, and occasionally in a movie or something like that. Uh, in, in my world of fantasy, um, and there were times where things were, were really nice with my parents. They would have parties sometimes, a lot of celebrations. Um, people would come over to our mm -hmm. house and, you know, they would have... Uh, I mean, again, it was like this crazy thing where we'd get up in the morning and there would be two or three people passed out in the living room floor. But, um, you know, it was still kind of this joyous feeling of, uh, of, of, of celebration. We strangers know each other now as part of a whole design. Oh, hold me like a baby that will not fall asleep. Curl me up inside you. You've spoken before, I think quite movingly, about how from a very early age, touch was important to you and you, something you, you needed and, 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 and were drawn to. And, and I find your song Gypsy so beautiful. It's like one of the songs I love to go back to and listen to a lot. And it's a lot about that. Yeah. The description of sort of romantic love, but also wanting to be held like a baby, you know, when, when a baby won't go to sleep. It's very beautiful. Um, and I was going to ask you about not, not just that song, which you wrote, I know, when you were 18 and you were a camp counselor upstate in the Adirondacks, but just generally who in your world did you feel the most connected to as a young person? Well, um, I was not a touchy-feely kid. I have the feeling I was very standoffish. It, it was easy for me to feel pain. Uh, you know, if someone mm -hmm. touched me the wrong way, I, I, I would flinch. I, I didn't like it, and uh, I was very nervous. Um, but on the other hand, I was good with kids. I was really good with my brothers and sisters, and we played together a lot. Uh, I would wrestle with my brother Matthew or throw him down and sit on him, <laughs> which that ended when he, when he punched me in my back one day. He, I suddenly realized he was taller than me, and that sort of ended that. Um, but like, I remember being very physical with Allison. She would lie with her head in my lap and I would stroke her hair. Mm. Um, and mm. Timothy, they would, all the kids would come into my bed 
uh, at night uh, if they had had a bad dream or something like that. So we would all sort of cuddle together like puppies, you know, like animals. Yeah. And we needed that from each other. And so I babysat a lot also. So I felt very comfortable handling children and handling babies, handling um, young kids. Um, I, I felt mm. uh, comfortable d- doing that. Um, but I was very wary of adults and, and, uh, um, and very nervous uh, around people my own age, I would say. And in terms of that theme of feeling connected and touch, how did the romantic side of that equation or just sexual awareness generally affect this aspect of touch as you sort of aged through and went to high school performing arts, you know, the fame high school and danced and were a person in the city? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you bluntly that my first experiences with, with sex were not very, they were very... They were forced. Uh, I, I was not happy. Uh, I didn't. I had sex at a young age, and I did not want to be having sex. Um, so that was mm-hmm. a very. That, that meant I stayed away. Uh, I, it made me very wary, and very. Um, you know, it it was. I was drawn to boys. I really liked them. Uh, I had boyfriends, but I would always break it off before it became too intimate. You know, it was just, uh, I was very yeah. fragile. There was a big difference between sex and even affection, kindness. With a long and slender body and the sweetest, softest hands And we'll go away forever soon and go on to different lands I suppose it, uh, that experience with the guy that I wrote Gypsy for was probably the first time that it was actually a romance that involved sexuality and sort of touching and a friendship and all of that um, together. Um, so that was by the time I was 18. And the feelings that are expressed in the song are a tenderness yeah. that, that show the different layers of romantic connection, right? It's, it's it, like, like I said, hold me like a baby that will not go to sleep. I just, you know, and, there, and it go, that's, that's not sort of, you know, a typical team. No, it's not like, hey, <laughs> baby. Yeah, no. it's not like, uh, yeah. you know, I'm, uh, you know all, all that stuff no. that we see, you know, uh, all the time yeah. in the top 40 these days. No, it's a different thing. He was a, a guy who was raised by his grandmother and had cousins with the children and so he was babysitting and trying to get his baby cousin oh. to go to sleep and had uh and h- had to hold it uh, hold the child you know for hours at night so he had told me that he said i feel like you're the, the you know my baby cousin that i used to hold in order to get it to go to sleep so that's how he was holding me so that's why it all kind of spilled over mm. that so i just i basically wrote down what he said so it was, it was a lovely, we're still friends. It's very nice friendship. talked about how you picked up a guitar you know relative, very young you were 11 you started writing songs at a very young age and eventually the balance switches from dance and sort of expressing yourself creatively through your, your body in that way to songs and lyrics and singing and the voice and your guitar uh, and that's really what you are known for and I was going to ask you what it was like for you to begin to make meaning of your of your life in that way well one thing that was important to me was I didn't want to be the kind of person that just always wrote from my own perspective. Um, a song like Gypsy, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it, it's a very personal song, but on the other hand, it's, there's nothing about it that I don't want to share about it, you know, uh, mm-hmm. but I didn't want to be limited mm-hmm. to that perspective. 
I wanted to have the freedom to write about whatever I wanted to. And, and especially once I saw Lou Reed at Columbia and I, I really noticed how he didn't stick to one gender. As she's making up her eyes He had this song Caroline Says and it was pretty much from Caroline's point of view so there's Lou writing a, this very meaningful song from this woman's point of view and I, I like that and I wanted that freedom. As she gets up off the floor, you can hit me all that you want to, but I don't love you no more. Um someone had told me that there was this hierarchy of clubs in New York that first you play the bitter end then you go to Folk City and then if you're really good you play the bottom line so I had this very literally stuck in my head so I was like I'm gonna play the bitter end and I just kept going back there and the guy I still remember his name and his face he would watch me sing this you know I would try different things every week and he would listen to me and he would eat his dinner at the same time and then he would say no <laughs> of every single time. Um, so finally it dawned on me to go around the corner to Folk City. Like, just go away. Yeah, go, go to, to step, step two. two. Forget about it. I mean, it was two years already. So I made a demo tape and went to Folk City and managed to bring 30 people down from Columbia. I said, I'm playing Folk City on a Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock, and 30 people came down, which to them was a huge audience. So I was, yeah, I, sure. that was my beginning at Folk City of five years of playing there. Um, so the really, the important thing is that you have something to say. If, if I were to give advice to any artist right now, it, it yep. really has to come, I think, from the inside out. And you have to be able to, to keep that going through those dry periods when no one's applauding, no one's giving you gigs, you're not getting the money or the respect you feel you deserve or whatever, and you have to learn to make it through those dry, long dry periods by nourishing yourself and keeping that, that light or that, that vitality alive. Would you like another one? Yeah, and you know what you were saying before too, about having to believe in your, your own truth and, and follow your inner light. And, and if you have something to say, you say it. What, what I also find interesting about y your perspective is that you were growing up around someone who was trying to do that, right? Your, your step, Ed Vega was trying to be, become a writer and not succeeding yeah. at it. And, and really having a hard, hard time getting anyone to see him um, and to pay attention, even though he felt for sure that he had something to say. Well, people would pay attention, yeah, and, and he worked hard at it. That's so, the other thing, too, is that he yeah. he was dedicated to it. He would work all night. He Sometimes I would read his manuscripts. I knew how hard he worked on on his, on his the words that he chose. And, and not only that, but he tried to teach us that, too, how to express yourself. That was the message. That's why he put me in front of him. He said, how do you feel? You know, he wanted me to express myself. Right. This was his uh, lesson, in a sense, is in a violent way, but it was still his, his. That's what he was attempting to to teach us. I learned that lesson. I learned how to do it my own way. Uh, yeah. yeah. And as you began to have success, um, and and really quite meteoric success in the eighties, nineteen eighties, how how was that for him? Well, there were times where he was very enthusiastic and very happy and very proud. At first he couldn't believe it. He was like, how did that happen? I mean, who's responsible for this? Um, you know, he wanted to find out, like, <laughs> what's exactly going on here? Um, so there were those times. But then as it continued, um, it gradually drew us apart. Uh, not that we had ever had an easy relationship to begin with, but uh, eventually... Um, the success, I feel, was something he he resented. 
um, mm -hmm. so it became even more difficult to 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 maintain a relationship with him. And then later on, I mean, I thought he had a tremendous success with uh, with the with the book that that came out in two thousand and five. Um, the Bill the Bailey, Bill Bailey book? book, yeah. I mean, he got um, tremendous yeah. reviews and. Um, so I remember thinking it, this finally happened. It finally happened for him. And I was hoping that he had a sense of, of happiness and satisfaction. But I don't think that's what happened. I, th I think he ended up fighting with the book company. He didn't want to be moved to an ethnic imprint. And then he d died suddenly in 2008. Uh, which was almost immediately after this, yeah, uh, after this, after the success, it was very shocking. One of your all-time classic songs, Tom's Diner. You know, for any New Yorker, they love it. They can tell you where Tom's Diner yeah. is, you know, 112th and Broadway. But alienation is an important theme yeah. there. And it's a way that, you know, New Yorkers can be in places like a diner and not quite connect, not quite see each other. But then there's also this beautiful ending to the song, which is about connection through a memory. Yeah. Right. So you're sitting there and you're... The, the, the bells ringing at St. John the Divine on the street trigger a memory of a midnight picnic. So that's a kind of a mythical, beautiful <laughs> idea of New yeah. York. And I'm wondering about, over the course of your life, the trajectory of your career, the ebbs and flows of that alienation and that feeling of connecting and that beauty in New York that one can feed off of, you yeah. know, in terms of memory. Yeah, yeah. Um... I feel less alienated now these days than I did as a child and as, as especially as a teenager and young adult. Um, I, you know, I have a, I have a family. I have been in a marriage for 15 mm -hmm. years. I have a daughter who's 26. Um, I have a community that I belong to. And uh, so I, I don't feel those moments of alienation quite so sharply as I did when I was younger. Oh, this rain, it will continue through the morning as I'm listening the bells of the cathedral I am thinking of your voice there's also this idea like in the song that Everyone you're you're walking or brushing past is a, a storehouse for life experiences, memories, stories, vitality, personality. You know, there are other pieces of your writing where you even talk about this as a young kid, how there was a woman across the alleyway oh, yeah. from you <laughs> yeah. growing up. And when you were 16, your your brother called her Elmer Fudd, but she was a woman. Right. And she you, you actually interviewed her for a school project through the windows. She was in her window and you were in her yeah. window. It was a woman who just would look outside all the time. And it, that's the kind of person you'd walk past nine times out of ten and never think about. But when you actually engage her, she didn't think her life really mattered that much, but she remembered World War One, flappers, the Depression. She had been a model. She lived a yeah, life. she was this, she had been a model. Yeah, she, she been had a been model. a model. She had a, a husband. Yeah. yeah. And I was thinking that's another aspect of New York, right, where all of us are these containers of amazing stories but we also are, you know, in a place where we can often feel the city's indifferent to us or other people are indifferent to us. And it's that idea of you're surrounded by this, but you're not always touching it. Yeah, exactly. It's hard to describe that to someone who doesn't come from here. Um, mm -hmm. That sense of privacy that you have. The, you know, you're squashed up against someone else on the subway. So therefore you have to maintain your privacy because if you start staring at someone in the face or sharing jokes i mean it's way too intimate you're already crushed way up too. against somebody um so you don't you don't make eye contact and you don't s stare at them and you don't talk about your day or you know you just like stay cool holly came from miami fm
hitchhiked her way across the USA Plucked her eyebrows on the way Shaved her legs and then he was a she She said, hey babe, take a walk on the wild side and yet you can bump into people here that change your life. Yeah. And, you know, it's that proximity. And you mentioned going to see Lou Reed before you were at Barnard, and he's performing at Columbia across the street. And he would become someone who was an important person in your life. You know, you've actually covered Walk in the Wild Side in your beautiful uh, new album, An Evening of New York Songs and Stories that you performed at the Carlisle. Did you and, and Lou Reed ever talk to one another about your childhoods? Uh, no, we did not. We did not talk about our childhoods. Um, it, talking with Lou was a very interesting experience in that uh, he was always in the moment. Uh, and he always mm. wanted to talk about whatever was on his mind. Um, most of the time I was more reactive. Uh, so it wasn't like he was going to share like in these intimate moments with me uh, uh, about his childhood. Um, you know, but he'd tell me how he felt about certain things, uh, who, who he was pissed off at. <laughs> 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 or, uh, you know, what he thought about something that I'd given him to read or, you know, we had our moments of, of connection, yeah. but it was not usually introspective, you know. At the very end, he sort of started to ask me questions. And I found it was very hard for me to suddenly just open up, you know, after 30 years of being yeah. his friend. But it, it was a lovely, really interesting, interesting friendship. Yeah. And, you know, he he's another person where you when you read about him fully, you get people who say he could be really mean. That's right. He could be cantankerous. That's right. He could, he <laughs> you could know? be really mean. And we were talking about another person in your life, Ed Vega, yeah. right? Your stepfather who could be cantankerous and mean. Well, I kind of got that. And so yeah. I, thinking, I mean, in some ways, that's probably why I was attracted right. to him because it, it, you know, it was it was that they were trying to get at its truth. They were trying to get at a sense of truth, mm -hmm. and that can make a person confrontive, and it can make a person kind of destructive in a way. Um, so I understood that. I understood that about Ed, and I understood it about Lou Reed. Uh, at the heart of their art, I felt was a desire to to get at the truth of 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 living, which is um, very often cruel. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted to learn how to express that. So I think that's partly what drew me there. There's so many things we could talk about, but I, I, and about New York in particular and your life in New York, but I was drawn to um, one particular song, which is Zephyr and I. Zephyr and I stand out on West End Avenue Talking about the things that all of us used to do It, it came out of the loss of your brother Tim, your younger brother Tim yeah. Vega, who died a few months after 9-11, and I think was traumatized by the event, not because he was there, but because he could have been there, right? He, he was home from work that day and it affected him. And so after he died, there was a memorial service and you brought these 30 wreaths to a, a local landmark in the neighborhood where you grew up, which is the Fireman's Memorial on 100th, 100th and Riverside Drive. And you met someone there, uh, Andrew Witten, who, uh, Zephyr, who is a, an iconic graffiti artist in New York of the, of the era in which you were growing up, and you connected. So anyway, I wanted to ask you about that connection and that story. Yeah, I had the 30 wreaths in my own house for a while, and the boyfriend I had at the time was allergic, and he just kept, he, he told me to get, get rid of them because he kept waking up like with his eyes streaming, and he, you know, he was... Um, sneezing and having a hay fever. So I said, okay, I, I'll do that. And I lived near the Fireman's Monument at that time. So I, I did, I took them all there. Um, and it's so moving because it was a part of your neighborhood. Yeah. It, it, it was some place that you would have grown up around. I'm thinking about even like when you went, ran away, it wasn't, wasn't that far from where you would be running Exactly. To. Andy reminded me that the Fireman's Monument was a place where kids would meet and hang out. Mm -hmm. um, and in the 70s, there was no place for a, a person to go if you were a teenager and you didn't want to go home. Um, so the, when he says, 
the, when he says all that stuff about the youth mall of America, like looking down on West yes. End Avenue and it's like the youth mall of America, that's that's because there were all these kids hanging out. There was no Covenant House. There was no place to go. Uh, um, so, it, and at, at one point people used to sleep in cars. They used to have abandoned cars all over New, all over the city. Um, and then sometimes kids would set them on fire. It was very dangerous. And that was all going on in the 70s. Um, and he reminded me of all that because he was one of those kids hanging out in the street in the 70s. After my experience in the park, I never did that again. I never, I wouldn't go out and hang out. I would just go home. I sort of invented a, an, an alter, alternative universe in my mind. Uh, so I would go to school and, and then I would go home. I didn't go out and hang out with people. Mm-hmm. Um, but he did. Zephyr was an artist, a graffiti artist who was looked up to. And your brother, Tim was also an artist. Oh, more than that. Um, uh, no, I remember when Timothy first met Zephyr and he came home and he was just like, he couldn't believe it. Both Matthew and Timothy were great fans of Zephyr's. He used to tag their name all over their notebooks and, and had they, they also had a very strong interest in graffiti back then. Um, but Ed told them not to deface public property and they, that if they wanted to do um, graffiti, they could do it on uh, as art, uh, which they did. They both did. My, and so all three of my brothers and sisters, Matthew, Timothy, Allison, were are, are all artists. Out on the corner by the fireman's monument That was the place where all the fatherless teenagers went kicks up with the smell of rain And the kids are gone but the souls remain Where in New York, New York do you feel the presence of, of souls the most? Gosh, almost every place in New York City. Uh, there's hardly a street that I can go down where I'm not reminded of my younger years especially since I live pretty clear, close by to where I grew up back then. I'm constantly running into my younger self and and the, all the souls of New York that I feel. There's not a time when I don't. And what about when you walk past the old home on 102nd Street, you know, or or you dream of it? Well, I used to be afraid of it, um, but I've kind of gotten over that because I, I've been past there. It's... That block is between where I live and where my mother lives. So I'm constantly walking past there now. I mean, now I associate it with like Starbucks. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah, I'm like, oh yeah. I, uh, so, but for a long time, I it had ghosts around the stoop, you know, and I could feel them, and uh, it it worried me, and I didn't like it. Um, but it, that it. I've integrated those now more into my life. They're not so segregated. Those mm-hmm. old ghosts that were so frightening um the the and were they ghosts of the kids that would be outside me and and my brothers and sisters and the games we played on the stoop there Mm -hmm. and uh, and the things Mm -hmm. that we experienced in that house and um i don't know somehow it's as i've gotten older it's they're not so separate and it's not like crossing a forbidden line anymore it's it's a little more more integrated and a little more whole holistic i feel like things are are brought in. I can accept them now. Um, I think the world has changed. People are so much more open about violence than they used to be about violence that they've experienced, and um, so it's not yes. like this. We that's definitely yeah. I, I see it more in the media. I see it more in the in the press, in the paper, and I uh, people are just more open about it. So uh, I feel that these things are not so forbidden as they once were. I, I wonder if in writing and being a writer and, and using some of the materials from your childhood in particular, if it if it changes your relationship to it. You it know definitely what I mean? as, does. As a creative Absolutely. person. Yeah. I mean. You, you, you make things out of it. Yeah, you make yeah. something out of it. And I mean, the danger, of course, is then you remember what you wrote of it and you don't remember the thing anymore. Uh, and then other people respond to it. You know, again, it's one thing to yes. to make something out of it, but then it's something else to have a communal response to it. Uh, I think that matters, um, even if it's on a small level. With your own work in particular, I, I, it, what's intriguing about it, 
you were able to maintain a mystery, sort of an enig enigmatic quality to your work because you did change perspective. And, yeah. you know, uh, I think even Ed, as you described, when, he, when Luca came out, he wasn't quite sure. That's right. <laughs> that was obvious. so shocking. He wasn't quite yeah. sure what it was, you know, was it about yeah. him? And so you maintain a distance, but as you say, over time, that new truth can in some ways- Take over. <laughs> sometimes yeah. overlay the old yeah. truth. Well, I think that's important. I, I, I was never yeah. sorry that I did that. I was never sorry that I didn't come mm -hmm. out saying, my name is, uh, I'm Luca, and here's my story, and it's right. all about me. Uh, I really wanted to maintain that distance. Uh, it allowed me a lot of freedom and anonym, uh, anonymity, and uh, I felt that it was important that the, that the song was true. And we knew the song was true, and I knew the song was true because people responded. Uh, you know, all kinds of people still yes. respond. Then they say, that was my story. Uh, uh, you know, they say, they say to me, that your story yes. is the story of my childhood, and I, I, know, I know it. And so that's more important to me than my talking about my feelings endlessly. I end every interview, Suzanne, with the same question, which is thinking about places and what remains and where we look for one another. And, you know, there's the uh, maybe no more iconic poet in New York than Walt Whitman. <clears throat> and he's certainly someone who's special to me. I love Leaves of Grass. I just love uh, Whitman's voice, and I love looking for Whitman in the city. Mm -hmm. And in his 1855 book, Leaves of Grass, in Song of Myself, he writes these words. So I'm I want to read them to you and then ask you a okay. question. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless, and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere, waiting for you. You know, if someone 50, 100, 200 years from now comes across Suzanne Vega, you know, your music, you know, your story, where would you tell them to look for you, to go, and to, at least for a few minutes, stand where you were and to feel connected to you? I, this, is, this is the first thing that comes to my mind, uh, and it's kind of funny, but uh, I, I recently found out that the playground I used to play in when I went to PS 163, that there's a name for that playground, and it's called the Happy Warrior Playground. And I didn't know that when I was going to school there, but it, it's a school for, it's a school named after Alfred E. Smith, who I guess was called the Happy Warrior mm -hmm. by FDR. And it's on Amsterdam Avenue. Right, Amsterdam Avenue, 97th Street. So it's still there. Mm -hmm. I still walk by it all the time. And every time I look in there, I, re I have yeah. memories of games I played and, you know, things that went wrong, good things, bad things, crushes that I had on boys and, uh, f you know, certain things that didn't go so well, whatever. Uh, so... I just became aware of that place, and uh, I, I think that's a place where you might find my spirit there. Um, it was certainly there for four years, and and I feel it when I go by there. I now when I now that I know the name of it, I'm like ah, that's my old spot. I'm pretty happy to say the Happy Warrior Playground is where you can find my spirit. <laughs> and you are our Happy Warrior. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Suzanne Vega, thank you so much for taking us to your hometown. Thank you. It's been such a thank pleasure. Thank you. Thank and you for. I'm so grateful for the time you spent. Some with awesome me. questions. Thank you very much. Your hometown is a Kevin Burke production. For more, please visit our website at yourhometown.org, where you can listen to all our past episodes and find show notes and artwork for each guest. Also, when you get a chance, check out our show's New York City series page on the Museum of the City of New York's website at mcny.org/slash your hometown hyphen podcast. The museum's website includes live events that we hold together, including one I'm recording tonight with Suzanne Vega. Don't miss it. Now, this is the last episode of our New York City season before the show's mid-season break. We'll be back with new episodes in the fall. But in the meantime, I hope you have a wonderful summer and definitely stay connected with us because we do have some very special things planned. 
Now, before I go, let me thank the outstanding team that works with me in your hometown, beginning with our executive producer, Robert Krolwich, our art director, Nick Gregg, our editor and sound designer, Oda Streeter, our composer and performer, Sterling Steffen, and our researcher, Shaquilla Khan. Our branding and website design is by Tama Creative, and our social media is managed by Kayla Hailstern. A special thanks, too, to our partners this season, the Museum of the City of New York. I also can't possibly thank enough the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and all our financial supporters for their deep belief in this series. It's wonderful working with them. Until next time, thanks so much for taking this ride with me. And remember, everyone's from someplace, and everywhere is somewhere.